show host Glenn Beck has said that America is on its way to normalizing pedophilia based on the way transgender rights have changed in the country's culture. Now to a story about one of the most sensitive subjects imaginable, the abuse of children. There are some people who think attitudes and actions towards pedophiles should be adjusted. The TEDx speaker says pedophilia is a natural sexual orientation. So um, she says we need to differentiate between child sex abuse and pedophilia, that it's, pedophilia is a natural sexual orientation just like heterosexuality. has blessed you and you would like to sow into the ground of this ministry, please see below. We love you and we appreciate anything you're able to give, even if it's a dollar. Any money given goes to those who are in need and to further this ministry. Thank you. It's 2018. There's gonna be drag kids in the world. And I'm one of them. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. This is the Desmond is Amazing episode. Our special guest, the amazing Desmond, Hello. all the way from Brooklyn, drove through rush hour traffic to get here. Hot, 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 it's hot tea. It's 9.40 p.m. and he doesn't have to go to school tomorrow. He just took one of those before 
of starting. Well, we should introduce, we should explain to the viewers who Desmond is. Desmond is the world's youngest club kid, and we challenge you as the viewer out there to find a younger club kid. Will they find? Anyone can do drag. Everyone can do drag. Everyone. Can Your do mom drag. can do drag. One four hundred dollars off. There's no genders. You can be male, female, any or none. What has this world come to? It's come to a world where drag kids actually exist. And people do ketamine on a couch. Exists. And people do ketamine on a couch. And if you haven't heard the name Desmond Napolis, get ready for this trailblazing 11-year-old drag kid who RuPaul is calling the future. His bravery is inspiring so many. We're going to talk to him in just a moment, but first, let's take a look at his amazing story. I am Desmond. I'm 11 years old, and I like pizza, trains, and drinking root beers and that's caffeine free. I also do drag, and I love to put on makeup, dresses, and wigs, and of course, jewelry if necessary. My full drag name is Desmond is Amazing. I feel very happy to have a mom that accepts me. It really touches me deeply that there are other children out there that he's reaching and they're listening to him and he's influencing them to be themselves. I'm very proud of him. I'm proud that he's found his path so early. My greatest joy in this is just seeing Desmond happy. I love doing drag because it makes me feel amazing and self-expressive. It just feels amazing to know that people love what I do. My one big message would be three words, be yourself always. Please welcome Desmond Naples, a.k.a. Desmond. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Oh, my people, they... Hello, hello, Desmond, how are you? How you doing? But, Desmond, you're one of the youngest and first drag queen slash kids, and I've heard... <laughs> messages from young adults who look up to you for being who you are. What are some of the notes you've gotten? Some of the notes I've gotten are like that you inspire me very much and I wish I could have had the support that you have um, when I was a child. They support me by letting me do what I want to do and um, let me um, dress up and let me play with um, makeup and trains, and um, yeah, I really like trains. When I'm out of drag, most of the time I'm playing with trains. How are you? Come on. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's also awesome that you are blessed with parents that yeah. love and support you unconditionally. Drag Queen Storytime in Lafayette is over with no big issues despite protesters gathering against the group. Until recently, the library was tied up in council and legal battles for four months after they announced the controversial event. Justice Henderson was there. Several families gathered at the Southside Library for Drag Queen Storytime. Parents and their children who waited months were eager to sit and listen to the drag queens read. We had our t-shirts since October, so they were finally getting a chance to wear their t-shirts. Um, so yeah, they were just, they were really excited. I mean, I, and I think for kids, you know, they don't see all these like huge differences. You know, they just, they see something new and they're excited about it. The kids and parents sat patiently as each drag queen read one book and the drag queens hoping to send a message. May they be different, may their friend be different, to always just be open and honest with everyone and to accept anyone, whatever walk of life they may be. The story hour was met with opposition on the outside of the library. Several protesters stood on the corner of the street holding signs against the event. 
This is something that, you know, we as members of the community cannot accept. Do dogs do drag? Do dogs do drag? I mean, they can. You can dress a dog up in a, in a dress and, and take them on stage with you. Hi, how are you? I'm great. What's your name? Crystal. I'm Isabella. Nice to meet you, Isabella. Nice to meet you too. What's your name? Kristen. Nice to meet you. I'm Isabella. What do you think of my outfit? Good. Do you like pink? Yeah, that's my favorite color. Mine too. What's your job? I do drag for a living. Are you on stage? I am. Huh? Yeah. I. <laughs> And I go, uh, okay, I'll quit for you, but you understand, this is being shown... Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. On June 20th, 1987, in the mountains of Ararat, Turkey officially recognized the discovery of Noah's Ark. Located on a mountainside about 15 miles south of the volcanic Mount Ararat, the remains of the massive ship were dedicated during a special ceremony. Guest of honor was Ron Wyatt due to his 10 years of research at the site. The story began in 1957 during the Cold War when aerial photos taken of eastern Turkey while searching for Soviet missile bases revealed a strange boat-shaped formation in the mountains about 6,300 feet above sea level. Thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty, and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. Thou also, which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame, in that thou hast justified thy sisters. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, in the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives. So were you kind of happy to let them to let them know? I was I was pretty scared. I went up in front of my commander and the doctor and a whole bunch of people and I said, um, I'm transgender and please let me keep my job. Hi, so Hi. I'm Kira. Hi I'm Kira. I'm the big sister. I'm Arissa, the little oh. one. <laughs> Arissa? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm my, Katie. My name's Issa. Issa? Yeah. That's nice. That isn't easy. So you know I'm in the military. Yeah. Uh, do you know what else? Mm, no. Do you know what it means to be transgender? Mm-mm. No? I, you know, when you're born, the doctor says it's a boy or it's a girl. Yeah. And sometimes they're wrong. 
They're sometimes, wrong. yep. Sometimes when you, as you get older, uh, you realize that's not right, and so mm -hmm. you change, you transition from one to the other. Wow, I felt like I could tell, but I didn't want to like be rude or anything. So, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Oh, that's okay. So, what made you think that? I don't know. I feel like kind of your voice is like a little deeper. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. When did you know? I remember being like six or seven and thinking, no, this isn't right. I tried to be a boy and I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> so, would you rather be a girl or would you rather be a boy? Well, I'd rather be a girl. Oh. Is it kind of like how how people, like, a boy could like a girl color? Do you really think there's, like, boy colors and girl colors? No. Not really? Because, I mean, I kind of like purple. I change my favorite color every year. <laughs> it's... Me too. <laughs> I like wearing makeup. I like wearing dresses. But that's not what makes me a girl. It's more about who you know you are inside. So you, you just didn't feel like sort you were of. meant to be a boy? Exactly. I couldn't, I was holding back. Yeah. I knew I was a trans woman, but I didn't want to be at the time. I thought, no, this is, nobody can know, this is, this is something I'm ashamed of. Back then I thought, the army, it's pretty masculine. Maybe if I'm a soldier, then those thoughts will go away. After coming back from Iraq, it really just, it came down to, I can't fake it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like holding a secret. Exactly. Like, like if you have a crush on someone, you're like, I'm not gonna ever tell anyone. And then like you tell them and then they're like, ooh. <laughs> but uh, afterwards, it's kind of worth it because you're not carrying it around anymore. Life Magazine reported on the story after an expedition from the United States went to the site in 1960. Blowing holes in the strange formation, the members of the team came away with the conclusion that there was nothing there of any archaeological interest. Ron Wyatt, like many others, read the story, but he was of the opinion that the site needed further exploration. There had been many claims of seeing Noah's Ark on the volcanic Mount Ararat, but Ron knew that it was a stratovolcano, and he believed that nothing would have been able to survive there. He noted the biblical account of the location of the Ark, and the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Uratu, the biblical Ararat, was a large region in eastern Turkey. This location was certainly feasible. But the factor that captured his interest the most was the length given in the Life magazine story, 500 feet. Most people were looking for a 437-foot Noah's Ark based on the Hebrew cubit. But Ron again went to the Bible to learn more. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Moses was the author of the Genesis account of the flood. He would have known the cubit of the Egyptians. The Hebrew cubit didn't come into existence until there was a Hebrew nation after Moses' death. The Encyclopedia Britannica stated, The Egyptian cubit is generally recognized as having been the most ubiquitous or universal standard of linear measurement in the very ancient world. The royal cubit equals 20.62 inches. This would mean Noah's Ark was much longer than 437 feet. Seventeen years after the Life magazine article, Ron finally made the journey to Turkey. One of the things I, I think we've missed in this whole transgender issue is the inherent Gnosticism that's behind it. Gnosticism is, is the most persistent, um, creative. It keeps popping up in new ways. Uh, and, uh, and it's the oldest heresy in the, in the Christian church. It's this idea that there's an inner knowledge that's, that, that, that's kind of special and unique to me, and it's more important than anything else, including physical reality. And that's really where transgenderism has taken uh, American culture, is into this new understanding that it doesn't matter uh, what our biological parts are, what's most true. In fact, what's only true, in some cases, it's like as if the biological parts 
have no relevance whatsoever. And we're talking about really earthy things like using the restroom or, you know, having a child or uh, getting married or whatever, uh, having sex. I mean, these are as, about as physical of activities as you can think of. And yet even in these situations, we say that what's most true uh, about us is uh, kind of how we feel and that trumps reality. Um, and, and this is a place where the Christian can really speak out. It's, 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 it's a long part of the Christian theological tradition to value the physical, uh, to value the body, that Jesus actually came in the flesh, and that was real, uh, and that we're not just kind of souls inhabiting a body. To be a soul made in the image of God is to be body and spirit. And that's a theological conviction that directly fi- flies in the face of where our culture is, Uh, But we don't teach it nearly enough in our churches and in our homes. I know my kids are on YouTube all the time, and this is a scary warning for parents who let their children go on YouTube. Some seemingly innocent videos that they put on could be targeted by a so-called softcore pedophile ring. Eyewitness News anchor Paul Boyd has been investigating the world's second biggest website that parents and children use every day. In this case, it's not only the videos on YouTube causing controversy, it's the comments. Let's walk you through this. Under most videos, people get a chance to comment on what they see like this, and that's where this all starts. A blogger claims a softcore pedophilia ring is zeroing in on videos featuring young girls. In many cases, they're in family videos of girls doing gymnastics, yoga, or just visiting the doctor's office. But this popular blogger says this ring is exploiting those innocent videos, making suggestive comments or highlighting points in which the girls may be in compromising positions. I'm making this video with only one intention. And that is to bring awareness to this, even though there is awareness already around the internet, but there's not enough. In a video that's now been viewed two million times, blogger Matt Watson says not only does YouTube allow this behavior, this pedophilia ring is actually making money off of it. What this is is child exploitation. Watson says it works in several different ways. The first, he calls a YouTube wormhole. The ring takes videos posted by young girls or their families and then reposts them, then abuses the YouTube algorithm, where if you watch one type of video, the website will suggest other similar videos. So if you click one of their videos of a young girl, it'll instantly suggest dozens more. My father is transgender, so that's what's really special about him. My mother, I'm happy that she gets to be happy, so it's super special for her. Transgender means you come out as a little girl or a little boy, and then they started, hey, I don't feel like I'm a girl at all. So they come out as a girl and then are raised as a boy, or come out as a boy and raised as a girl. And non-binary means that you don't believe that you're really a girl, but you don't believe you're a boy. Claire is We were really raising her just to be open, to be however she wants to be without any need for a label or identity and that she will in time discover who she is just as we have. Bruce Jenner is all over the news for his recent sex change surgery and name change to Caitlyn. Caitlyn has been hailed a hero by some in the LGBT community. But one man who has changed sexes twice says that the transgender movement has left a trail of misery in its wake. Is sex change surgery the answer to gender dysphoria? Here with us now by Skype is speaker and author of several books addressing sex change regret, Walt Heyer. Walt, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Now, first of all, not only have you done extensive research on sex change surgery, you've been through the process yourself, but you say it fixed nothing. What can you share with us about that? 
Yeah, you know, uh, when people go through this gender change, there's uh, very high expectations that, you know, their life is just going to be wonderful and everything's going to be great. And I, I can tell you the way it starts, that was true for me. But then there's a, a time, what I call, when you kind of begin to sober up and realize that gender reassignment surgery really doesn't make you a female. It's much more to being a woman than just having some cosmetic surgery and hormones. Definitely. Well, let's talk about the history of sex change surgery. Why do you say we shouldn't be so quick to push people with gender dysphoria towards it? Well, because what we do know today is that uh, well over 60 percent of the people who have a desire to change their gender are suffering from some what they refer to as a comorbid psychological or psychiatric disorder. And those disorders are often separation anxiety, schizophrenia is an example, bipolar disorder, dissociative disorder, personality disorders, narcissism, uh, that are not generally addressed prior to going through a gender reassignment surgery. They, they don't really do an adequate and deep psychological evaluation to see if these comorbids disorders actually exist in the transgender who's requesting a surgery change. When he saw the boat-shaped object, he saw that it looked just like it did in 1960, and he knew he would need permission to excavate in order to learn anything about what was beneath the surface. So he returned home and enlisted a number of friends to help him pray for an earthquake to reveal more. In late 1978, he learned of an earthquake in eastern Turkey and returned in August of 1979. When he arrived, he was overwhelmed by what he saw. The earthquake had dropped the soil around the object and a large crack extended the entire length. He could see what looked to him like the remains of decayed rib timbers along the now exposed sides. Also, he was able to measure the depth of the debris and measured the length. It was 515 feet, or exactly 300 royal Egyptian cubits. He was now convinced. He carefully combed the surface, looking for evidence that it was a shipwreck. He saw what he believed were petrified structures of an ancient ship whose deck had collapsed. He saw what looked like deck joists, and deck support timbers. Of particular interest was the fact that the ship appeared to be impaled on a large outcropping of limestone. He concluded that this indicated that the ship had slid into the rock from another location. Before he made his first trip to Turkey, he had done an experiment in a nearby lake, building mountain configurations out of rocks and floating a boat model by them to see the reaction of the boat. He noted that a crescent shape caused the water to pull the boat into the crescent where the boat remained and gently floated. The present location did not fit with the results of that experiment, so Ron decided to examine the area above the boat shape. The site was in a moving mud flow so he followed the mud flow up the mountainside. About a mile and a half up, he found a crescent shape of mountains. He saw that the mud flow began up here. When he arrived near the top of the ridge, he found an ancient stele, like an ancient billboard, which depicted the boat shape, the familiar mountain ridge, several birds, and eight faces within the boat shape. Clearly, this was a reference to the ship of Noah and its eight survivors. He noticed a taller mountain peak on the Stele that was no longer visible from that location. He concluded that it was a small volcano that had erupted long after Noah's Ark had landed and that it had carried the ship down the mountainside about a mile where it was impaled on the limestone outcropping, then covered in lava. 
The lava then encased the ship like a time capsule. The volcano then collapsed after expending its lava and was no longer visible. He then theorized that as the lava began to decay, water seeped in and allowed the remains to be petrified or fossilized by the process called mineral replacement. Molecule by molecule would be washed away from the remains and replaced by molecules from the objects and substances above it. As he examined the area within the crescent shape, he found a large section, 120 by 40 feet, approximately, of what appeared to be fossilized wood in the ground. He believed this to be the bottom of the ship, the original landing site. His conclusion was that when the flood water subsided, the ark sank into the muddy earth. This held the ship upright. Talk show host Glenn Beck has said that America is on its way to normalizing pedophilia based on the way transgender rights have changed in the country's culture. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, the next stop on this train is pedophilia. Beck predicted that Hollywood will soon try to normalize pedophilia based on claims from actor Elijah Wood that child sex abuse is commonplace in the entertainment industry. Now to a story about one of the most sensitive subjects imaginable, the abuse of children. There are some people who think attitudes and actions towards pedophiles should be adjusted. Correspondent Shannon Bream explains. A small group of psychiatrists and other mental health professionals is advocating changes to the way the American Psychiatric Association defines pedophilia in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM, saying those they call minor attracted persons are being unfairly stigmatized. Instead, a psychiatric term gets turned into something that's just a, a demonizing pejorative. Uh, that troubles me. Dr. Fred Berlin, associate professor at Johns Hopkins University Medical School, was the keynote speaker at a conference held by the group in Baltimore, Maryland last week. He says those pushing to redefine pedophilia are simply worried that the current perception keeps adults who are attracted to children from getting help. If there are people out there who are attracted through no fault of their own towards children, uh, we want to try to uh, assist them to make sure they don't act in ways that are going to cause problems for other people. But Berlin admits there were some at the conference who suggested sexual relations between adults and children are acceptable, something he says he does not condone. Dr. Judith Reisman, author of Sexual Sabotage, attended the event. The whole conference was slanted very clearly to the notion that pedophilia was a normal variation of human sexual conduct. In 1990 and 1992, the Baltimore Sun reported that Berlin refused to comply with a state law, requiring him to report patients he believed were engaged in child sex abuse, instead directing them to first see a lawyer, who could then direct them to Berlin, thus protecting any conversation under the attorney-client privilege. The Maryland Attorney General deemed that illegal. Today, Berlin labeled the accusation that he would refuse to report a pedophile actively engaged in child abuse, quote, absolutely false. Skeptics say the group Berlin spoke to has one goal, to move society a step closer to accepting sexual contact between adults and children, even decriminalize it. Absolutely. Oh, they're very clear about that. Their goal is to take all shame out of the lust for children. Okay. Well, in your book, Paper Genders, you address gender change regret from a scientific research point of view. Can you give us some highlights about that? Well, what we know is that when you uh, begin to alter someone surgically who has psychological disorders, 
we find a pr predominant number of people who suffer from these issues suffer for the rest of their life, even after a gender change. So we know from uh, not only from John Hopkins University, who was the one who launched the surgical program in the United States in 1966, after 10 years of doing the work, they interviewed people who had gone through the surgery and found that it was not effective in changing their uh, attitude and or their life for the better. And this also was played out by Dr. Illenfeld, who was worked with uh, Harry Benjamin for six years at his clinic and found that given hormone therapy uh, to transgenders uh, was causing them to have uh, too much unhappiness, in his words, uh, and too many suicides. So the suicides are really the dark side that people fail to talk about, and I'm glad we're having this discussion about it. At some point last year, this article showed up in newspapers all over the world. The police had taken down this massive child pornography network. It was on a dark net, and it had nearly 90,000 members. Lots and lots of illegal material were shared, and lots of messages were sent through the network. Every day, every hour, every second. People from all over the world were logging into this network anonymously, which makes it extremely difficult for the police to track them down. Now, some of these people only had the aim of collecting child abuse and material online. Others also had the aim of abusing children themselves. Regardless, they all found this deep satisfaction in discussing their deepest fantasies and experiences with regards to child abuse online. Apparently, there's a market for this. That most probably, there will be someone in your environment, someone you know, someone like your neighbor, like your colleague, like your football mate, maybe even your husband or son, who is struggling with these sort of feelings. The only thing is, you don't know about it. And here we get to a notion that I really want to emphasize, because even though these percentages are massive, most of these people know that they have feelings that they should repress. So most of these people don't act out on it. They don't offend, which is great, isn't it? But the problem is, these people can't talk about their feelings because they know that they will be hated for it. I truly do believe that every person is longing for love at some point in their life. And what if this love that you really wish for will forever be impossible? That must be a really lonely situation to be in. It's like telling me, we know that you love your boyfriend and we don't minimize this love. However, you cannot act out on it, ever. And on top of that, you won't be able to talk about it with anyone. So unfortunately, sometimes it does go wrong. Sometimes people do start offending. And I'm not justifying this. On the contrary, I, I work for police. I'm just saying that it's a logical thing to happen. He's saying this is a sexual orientation, like being heterosexual, like being homosexual. It's not something that can be changed. Is that accurate? Yeah, he's saying it's an orientation fixed from birth, which some of the research is showing now. It's, it's hard to measure because, you know, children don't have sex or look at pornography or all the things that we might use to measure sexual orientation. So we really don't know. But... But an orientation is different from a compulsion. Right. And one of the things we know about pedophiles is that they are often compulsion, compulsive. By the way, pedophilia is when there's more than five years age difference between the perpetrator and the victim, and the victim is prepubescent. Ugh. So l let's call him someone who, who has a sexual orientation towards children. We don't know if he's really a pedophile. I'm going to bring him in. His uh, name is Todd. This is the man who wrote the article. He says he is a pedophile. He is a moderator for a website, Virtuous Pedophiles, viverped.org. And uh, Todd, you were a young teenager when you first realized you were attracted to children. Is that accurate? That's correct. And what, and what did you do to combat this? Uh, how, how are we, I mean, I think some people would be skeptical when you say I've controlled these urges. Well, 
<clears throat> when I was 13, I repressed a lot of it. I kind of felt like it was a, um, uh, you know, it was something that I would get past eventually. And, so I didn't really dwell on it too much. And Todd, was, and Todd, you had sexual abuse in childhood. Is that accurate? Yes. A and you became a drug addict also, right? Yeah, but that had to do with uh, when I was depressed and... Well, but being unregulated, being traumatized, that, that's, you know, most... I, I would say 100% of my patients, well, for sure, if you had bad enough addiction that you needed to see me when I was running a program, you had physical or sexual or both abuse in childhood. That's just the way it goes. But, but so drug addiction is set up by this many times. My question then is, how do you know what you did when you were loaded? Mm. Well, I never got that... Uh, high. I took a few hydrocodone just to kind of deal with the pain. I was working out uh, every day, um, you know, so I was in physical pain a lot from that because I was depressed. And, you know, when you're depressed, uh, you your brain doesn't uh, deal with the, uh, you know, doesn't produce the chemicals that, that um, alleviates pain. Todd, so. Todd, I want to I get uh, some input from our audience here, if you don't mind. Yes, sir, go ahead. I just have a question about what support exists for that. If we're saying that it is like alcoholism, is there programs, is there support to prevent people that have come out as saying, like, this is something I'm well, inclined towards? I think towards. that's part of the this issue. This is what he's doing. That's the help? main thing. Well, there, I think he's creating a community. He's right. creating a community so that if you have these feelings as opposed to acting out on them, which is the horrible crime, that means that a child is being put in that position, yeah. you go to this community and you try and work through it with other people. And but your, it's also dealing but, with the mental health issues that we don't deal with in this is nation Is he going well. to the community for treatment or is he going to the community to talk about having sex with children? It's like a drunk -a log at an AA Hollywood studios are drenched in the blood of innocent children, according to Mel Gibson, who claims the consumption of baby blood is so popular in Hollywood that it basically operates as a currency of its own. Hollywood elites are an enemy of mankind, continually acting contrary to our best interests, and breaking every God-given taboo known to man, including the sanctity of children, Mel Gibson said in London, where he is promoting his role in Daddy's Home 2, his most prominent on-screen role in years. It's an open secret in Hollywood. These people have their own religious and spiritual teachings and their own social and moral frameworks. They have their sacred texts. They are sick, believe me. And they couldn't be more at odds with what America stands for. Mel Gibson appeared on The Graham Norton Show on the BBC on Friday, and he schooled shock guests about the real nature of Hollywood elites in the green room backstage after his appearance. Explaining that he spent the last 10 years working on my own ideas outside of the Hollywood system after being blacklisted by Hollywood in 2006 for sharing opinions about the industry and the world that run counter to liberal orthodoxy, Gibson said, I don't know how to break it to you gently. Hollywood is institutionalized pedophilia. They are using and abusing kids. They churn through a huge amount of kids every year. Their spiritual beliefs, if you can call them that, direct them to harvest the energy of kids. Well, this report was commissioned by the Bishop's Conference, who will be meeting today. And the findings of this report identified 3,677 individual victims of sexual assault by 1,670 members of the Catholic clergy. But of the reported cases of sexual abuse over the years were actually, uh, were actually handled by the church, and that was internally. Uh, fewer than half of the, the reported cases were actually taken. And uh, Cardinal and Reinhold Marx, who's overseeing the Bishop's Conference today, says he promises justice for the victims. But the, this, of course, will prove to be very difficult. We're talking about 70 years here of, of, of abuse that happened. So this is going to be, of course, very difficult. Then God sent the wind to dry the face of the earth. The portion of the ship that sank into the mud was now firmly embedded in the ground. Many years later, when the lava carried the ship down the mountain, the main body of the ship was ripped loose. Only this section remained in their original location. Around this area that Ron believed to be embedded petrified wood, he found specimens of rock which looked very unique to him. He took several samples, along with several specimens from the boat shape below. Back home, he sent them for analysis. The results showed organic carbon, which indicated that the samples were consistent with decayed and fossilized wood. They also contained metals such as iron and aluminum. 
The analysis of the strange-looking rock Ron had found about a mile and a half above the site by the bottom of the ship was clearly the most exciting. His initial analysis had shown it to be metals and not rock. In 1984, Ron met and became friends with Colonel Jim Irwin, the former astronaut. Colonel Irwin was searching for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, but he was very gracious and was interested in seeing the boat-shaped site. Ron had brought a metal detector to the site to see if there was a pattern of metal readings. In the presence of Colonel Irwin and others on his team, Ron employed the detectors. He found distinct metal lines down the entire length of the object, while no metal readings were obtained just outside of it. Ron asked Colonel Irwin, who had impressive scientific community connections, if he could have the strange specimen tested. Colonel Irwin sent the specimen to Los Alamos National Labs, where geophysicist John Baumgartner performed the analysis. The results of that analysis captured Dr. Baumgartner's interest. The specimen contained manganese, also titanium and aluminum, among others, and these were not in the form found in nature. Due to the sophistication of the metals, he questioned whether a missile had crashed on the mountainside and Ron had found the remains. The exciting evidences of the metal lines and the analysis of the specimens brought two new researchers into the work. Dr. Baumgartner and David Fassel, the marine salvage expert who knew all about ships and their construction. Approximately 2,500 children separated at the border from their families are supposed to be reunited by July 26th. While the country pays attention to that story, there's another detention story which has gotten less coverage. That is, allegations of abuse inside detention centers. Data from the Department of Homeland Security's Office of the Inspector General show that thousands of migrants have claimed they were sexually abused while in ICE custody. And BostonGlobe.com investigates the children of Catholic priests. The paper reports there are thousands of people who have strong evidence they are sons or daughters of clergy members. They say they're often neglected or shamed into... On Saturday, CBS News reports that the FBI has arrested a Toledo church's pastor and another man on charges of sex trafficking of children. On Friday morning, Cordell Jenkins and Anthony Haynes were taken into custody by FBI agents at their Toledo home. Federal documents accused the men of recruiting, enticing, and transporting people they knew were under 18 to engage in sex acts for pay. On Friday, a judge ordered Jenkins and Haynes to be held without bond until their hearing on April. So now Pizzagate's been debunked. That must mean that anyone who talks about the connections between pedophilia and people in positions of power must be a crazy extremist conspiracy theorist, right? Wrong. In virtually every major paedophile bust in every major country in the world, top politicians, judges, celebrities, billionaires, and other members of the establishment are always connected. Conspiracy theory? Okay, let's take a look. In 2008, financier Jeffrey Epstein, whose friends included some of the most powerful people on the planet, was convicted of soliciting an underage girl for prostitution. According to Fox News, Epstein, quote, allegedly had a team of traffickers who procured girls as young as 12 to service his friends on Orgy Island, an estate on Epstein's 72-acre island called Little St. James in the US Virgin Islands. Why did Bill Clinton take at least 26 trips on the Lolita Express, Epstein's jet? 
ditching his secret service detail for five of those trips. A jet accuser say was equipped for sex with underage victims and was used to travel to Epstein's private island, nicknamed Orgy Island. Newly obtained documents show Clinton actually took at least 26 flights on Epstein's private jet to spots around the globe, though apparently not after Epstein's plea deal and jail time. On at least five occasions that they did travel together, Secret Service did not accompany Clinton. You don't just dismiss Secret Service detail. Paperwork has to be filed. There's an accounting of why the dismissal. In this case, there isn't paperwork, and the Secret Service is not responding to the FOIA request. Why did Clinton choose to continue his association with Epstein when, according to the Alliance to Rescue Victims of Trafficking, Everyone within his inner circles knew he was a pedophile. Why did Epstein have 21 different phone numbers for Bill Clinton? Who were the prominent people Epstein reportedly blackmailed by secretly recording them with these underage girls? Who are the, quote, powerful associates named by victim Virginia Roberts that US authorities allegedly have on tape having sex with underage girls. While the accusations against Michael Jackson aren't new, the specifics and the details of what Wade Robson and James Safechuck uh, claim that he did to them have horrified so many, prompting e It's been over almost two years now, and we still haven't seen our daughter. The six-hour explosive series has been watched by more than 18 million people. New R. Kelly! Law enforcement is now involved in two states. Just today, protests raged outside Kelly Chicago studio. They both joined the team. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me get a close up of that. Kind of, um. You want my hand in there for? Yeah, just to point at those little okay. flakes of iron that are coming out, like right there. There and there. Huh. That's a strong reading. Hmm. Well, I'd say that that uh, those frames right there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> keep walking. Do you want Do you want a measuring tape to measure these things? How far apart they are? Dr. Baumgartner and Ron scanned the entire site with three different types of metal detectors. Placing rocks at each metal reading, they then attached tapes to show the lines. This exciting evidence also attracted the interest of ABC's 2020. The boat-shaped site was first found and photographed by a Turkish army captain back in 1959. It was quickly explored and dismissed as a freak of nature. But Wyatt, an amateur archaeologist, rekindled interest in it a few years ago. He brought in Dave Fassold, a marine salvage expert, to assess it. The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors, and it's been used by Fassold to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape, outlined by the ribbons, was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. 
The fascinating field of ribbon soon oh, attracted yeah, higher academic interest. Guy. That looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical ark. To resolve this final issue, Wyatt and Fassel brought geologist Tom Finner to Turkey with his company's heavy-duty subsurface radar equipment. Gear like this located the black box cockpit recorder on the floor of the frozen Potomac River after the Air Florida crash. It was here, several miles short of the boat-shaped site, that a waiting game began for Finner and the others. The party needed a final go-ahead from... So, Ontario passes a bill basically empowering the government to seize children from quote-unquote abusive caregivers who disallow gender transition. Interesting. Very interesting. The bill is known as the Supporting Children, Youth, and Families Act of 2017, or Bill 89. Now, basically, this bill instructs the government that the best interests of the child, among other things, like race and creed and family diversity and citizenship, should also include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression as well. Oh, so to be attracted to uh, someone of the same sex, if you act on that, it's a sin. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. You say, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. No, he talked about all sexual immorality because whenever he used the phrase sexual immorality, that meant any sexual activity outside of the marriage of a man and a woman. Fornication, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, rape, incest, whatever it is. When he's using that phrase, that's what he means. And of course, Christians believe Jesus wrote the entire Bible through the Holy Spirit. So the entire Bible is inspired. Now you can make other arguments, uh, natural law arguments. I have a little book on this called Correct Not Politically Correct, where you don't even bring the Bible into it. But we have to have compassion for people that have these attractions. Why? Because they didn't, they didn't wake up one day and say, I want these attractions. They had them for whatever reason. And so we all have attractions we ought not act on. And so we all have to hold one another accountable to attractions or to actions that are going to hurt themselves or others. So it's not just homosexuality. The reason homosexuality is such a big deal in our society because all the political things going on around us. Sexual sin is not the greatest of sins, but it is a sin. And where homosexuality falls on that, that's not for me to decide. The Bible calls all sin, all sex outside of the marriage of a man and a woman sin. Because, let's just take it from a very practical perspective. Very, very practical here. The culture tries to tell you that sin is just physical. I mean, sin is just physical. Sex is just physical. If that were the case, why is it that it's worse when somebody rapes you than when somebody just physically assaults you? Because sex is not just physical. It's emotional. It's moral. It's biological. It's spiritual. There's something beyond sex than just the physical act, and we all know it. Sex is like fire. If you put it in your fireplace, it will warm you. It's wonderful. If you get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. And we see that. Look, homosexuals didn't, didn't give us really same-sex marriage. You know who did? Heterosexuals through no-fault divorce. No-fault divorce is, is the worst thing that this country ever could have done from, from a marriage perspective because it makes marriage all about the desires of adults nothing about children. Well, if marriage isn't about children, why is the government even in it? Who cares who loves who? Why, why should the government care whether you have a romantic affinity for somebody else? The reason the government's involved in marriage is to perpetuate and stabilize society. That's why the government's ...related from the outside world, not even a telephone. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to hang in like smell on a skunk till there's nothing left to get this done. Hang in like the smell in the skunk. The Turkish government stopped the, the exploration. What now? Since we were there, Barbara, things have cooled down, and they've sent their own team of scientists in to take a look at this site. It's a very fascinating location. While Turkish scientists and archaeologists did their own research, Ron and his associates continued their work. 
The next step was subsurface interface radar. There's a longitudinal bulkhead. You ought to see them pop it out, man. Yeah, there they are. There's yeah. another one. There's the key line right there. Yeah. Oh, Ron, the lines are there! Ha <laughs> ha! The lines are there! Okay, we're gonna walk over. Yeah. Take a look. Leave it, leave it running so everybody knows that we're not cheating here, right? <laughs> you got it, Cole. Okay, now, this is the west, the west bulkhead. Okay, can you look through there and... All right. This is the west bulkhead. All right. That was over there. And he walked easterly. Here we start getting a longitudinal bulkage. Here, 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 here. here. Okay. You see there how it shows up? All right. The initial scans were very impressive, showing internal structure consistent with bulkheads and rooms. But to be sure they were interpreting the data correctly, Ron took the scan printouts to geophysical survey systems the developer and manufacturer of the radar. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random na natural type interface. There was no longer any doubt that this was the remains of something man-made. In late 1986, the Turks announced their decision. The ceremony was set for June 1987. During that ceremony, the governor asked Ron to demonstrate the radar on site for the journalists and military officials. When Ron showed them a readout that he said looked like an intact timber, the governor then instructed a soldier to dig right there. What emerged was this petrified section of fossilized, hand-wrought timber. Sectioning showed it to be laminated wood, five layers of timber glued together with pitch, clearly visible oozing from the end. This fossilized specimen shows that rivets were used in its construction. Their analysis showed that they contained iron, titanium, and aluminum, among other things very sophisticated alloys that would be resistant to water. Specimens falling out from the lower end of the ship identified as slag by an expert in metallurgy it indicated to Ron that Noah filled the hull with slag material from his metal production of the fittings used to build the ark. More complete radar scans revealed a ship, although damaged and collapsed in places, a very intelligent modern design with a ramp system at the door which led to each level. In 1990, Ron performed what he called a mini-excavation, where he took shovels and bent the blades into a giant razor. He and his associates then shaved off a very thin layer from one section, smoothing it to show the color difference between the structure members and the matrix. As you look at me now, I'm back to being who God wanted me to be as a man. And it doesn't really matter what I got between my legs because uh, no one's going to see it anyway. And uh, I, I've been reading my Bible every day and all I could hear was God saying, well, you really need to go back to being who I made you. And your story is great, but just don't do it as a girl because you're not a girl. And I know that. It just tears me up to think that 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 I did all this, and uh, I, I, I was a phony, I was a fraud, but I tried pulling it off. And, and, and people, people called me ma'am, and, and, and she, and her, and you know, I had my long hair. I, I didn't wear much makeup. As you can see, I got lip liner, I had the eyebrows tattooed, which now I gotta live this way, but it's a great testimony, and uh, I, I just wanna try to help someone else before they make the same mistake I did. Everybody I told I was getting a sex change and blah, blah, blah. They all said, oh, if that's what, if that's what you think is right, then go ahead and do it. You know, if you, if you, if you feel, good, feel good about it, you know, if that's what you want, go, go do it. And um, how can that happen when you're supposed to be accountable for your brothers and sisters and help them out? According to what I read, 
And uh, they didn't do it. They did not do it. And to this day, they thought I was going to be a disgrace to them. That's why they didn't do anything. They just told me to, there's the door. I said, okay, you know. But I always thought I needed to be important. And that, that's another reason all the tattoos and the, the piercings. I thought, uh, oh, I'm going to be somebody someday. Uh, I want to be famous, you know. But now I do want to be famous. But I want to be famous for God. And I want, to, I want to take everybody down the path that needs help. Please listen to this because without the Lord, you'll have nothing. You'll have nothing. You know, he's the... He's the vine and we're the branches and uh, we can do nothing without him. But the whole thing is why most people will not go to any of these things because it's all about the embarrassment. You are so embarrassed with what you've been doing that you can't tell anybody that. And that's what I kept a secret for all those years. I couldn't tell nobody. I was too embarrassed. But you have to stop. You have to stop and, 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 and get help because you're going to destroy your life. You're going to destroy the life of your, of your friends, your spouse, your whoever it may be because this is the worst thing that I think that, 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 that anybody could do is, is get involved in the, the sex uh, industry or business or, or whatever. It destroyed me, but praise God, uh, I'm set free now and I'm happy as can be. I am so happy, it's overjoyed, you know, because my life now is like over the top. I have nothing, but I have everything, if that makes sense. I have Jesus. I think one thing you should know about sexual identity if your child seems confused is I think you need to know um, God's intention for sexuality in the sense of in Genesis 1 where it says that when God said let us make man in our image and in the image of God he made them male and female I think we see in the scripture that gender or sex is not fluid it's not open to interpretation it's not uh, available for us as human beings to change God is God and I think as parents we have to be convinced of this truth because if we're not convinced of this truth we'll easily be led astray by trying to please uh, and affirm our children and we see that all the time uh, for your olds believing that they are another sex and the parents feeling like to be a loving parent I have to go along with this but if we are anchored by the Word of God then we better know how to then we know better how to handle these types of situations I also think it's valuable to know that any confusion about identity is rooted in sin when you look at Genesis 3 and you see uh, Satan's conversation with Eve his conversation with her is he's trying to influence her to find identity elsewhere he's trying to make her believe that she'll be better satisfied if she becomes like God and I think when you have conversations with your children and they're having tension with their identity it's the same tension that Eve was experiencing and gave into it's this idea that you have the ability to change who God made you to be and so as parents we have to know it is not for us to change God's will. It is not for us to change God's purpose. God is God, and in Him being God, He's wise, and He knows better than us. And so we can we have to teach our children that God is a wise God. So He was wise when He made you a little boy. He was wise when He made you a little girl, and He was good in doing so. And in doing so, He did it for His glory. So we can be parents convinced of this, then we can thus teach our children the same. Nearly 250 years, God patiently dealt with Israel, patiently wooing and sending uh, light afflictions, they were called at first, light afflictions, trying to woo them back into his blessing and into his favor and into his love. They were called to humble themselves before the almighty hand of God. All the prophets came to them speaking the same word, humble yourself, turn from your wickedness, turn from your wicked ways. But the scripture said instead they served idols. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, keep my commandments and my statutes. They would not hearken, but they hardened their necks. This chosen nation, this so blessed nation of God, nation called 
to repentance. Instead, they begin to mock their prophets. And they begin to follow vanity. They became vain. They left all the commandments of the Lord their God. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel. God sent wake-up calls to Israel. And Israel missed the message. In the midst of all of this turmoil and chastening by the hand of God, verse 8, the Lord sent a word into Jacob and it lighted upon Israel. Look at me, please. Never in the history of mankind has God ever left his people clueless during a time of disaster. Never. He's never left us clueless. He's never left us trying to figure it out on our own. He's always given an understanding. God spoke to his people in time of calamity. And even now, while I stand here, God is raising up prophetic messages today in pulpits all across America and around the world that are preaching just what I'm preaching to you this morning. He said, I'm going to take an evil nation and I'm going to use it as a rod to as a last resort to bring my people to repentance and to my heart that I may pro make provisions and I provide for it and protect it but they've turned their backs upon me and all the people shall know even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria and, and see this is the heartland that say in the pride and stoutness the word stoutness there in Hebrew is a sense of greatness in their pride and a sense of greatness of heart and they are saying the bricks are falling down, but we will build with hewn stones. Why do we find it so impossible to call for prayer and repentance meetings? Where is the call for turning back to God in America? Let me give you the message. God is trumpeting. I've sent you prophets and watchmen. You've been warned over and again. I prospered you above all nations. I endured your worship of gold and silver. I endured your shameless sensuality. I endured your mockery, your continual shedding of innocent blood and murdering of babies. I've endured your tireless efforts to eradicate my name even from your history books. And now I've stricken in hopes of saving you, that you repent and turn from your wicked ways so that I can heal your land and I will destroy your enemies. And what's going to happen if this nation misses the message and we don't turn wholly back to the Lord? And let's lay hold of God. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them, so also will the coming of the Son of God. 